So hello and welcome everyone. It's lovely to see so many friends, old and new and current, and we might get a bit of an influx of students, I think, when class is finished this morning. It's lovely to have you all here. We're feeling very proud today to finally launch this book. I nearly tried to say in my presentation when it was that we started working on the book, but I couldn't remember, to be honest, so I couldn't say that. But here it is, the book that we're all here to celebrate. Um, I'm Rosie McGee. I'm a senior fellow in the Power and Popular Politics cluster here at IBS. And um, I have on the panel with me Jethro Pettit, who most of you know because he was at IDS for a very long time. He's now having a nicer life elsewhere. Um, Fran Lambert from the organization Not One More, and John Gaventa, the director of research at IDS, who again, most of you know. Um, you should have found on your chairs a leaflet, either like this or a smaller black and white version. This is a promotional flyer for the book. It has a discount code on it. So when you purchase your copy, you can use the promotional discount code. Um, we're going to each speak in turn on the panel. Um, Jethro and I are going to be speaking as editors of the book, so giving a bit more of an overview of key points in the book. And then we'll be going on to Fran and John to speak about their own chapters in the book. And we're going to try to keep it quite short. Ideally, us, our parts will only take up maybe maximum half an hour. And we want to have plenty of time then for questions and answers and discussion and contributions from you and feedback. Um, as usual, we'll pause at 5 to 2 to let people leave if people need to go to classes this afternoon or go out for meetings at 2. And then we'll continue with those of you who, are, who can remain and take a bit longer to discuss at more length with you. So um, over to Jethro to kick us off. Thanks, Rosie. So I'm just going to talk about two aspects of the book uh, before pan passing back to Rosie. And one is about a little bit about why this book and why now. And the other is about what we think some of the uh, contributions the book makes to thinking about power and empowerment, sort of uh, theoretical contributions and so forth. So why this book and why now? I think power has always been a very elusive topic. And um, it's constantly shifting its shape and its definition. And uh, the changing nature of power and the way it's been contested, both in kind of academic debate, uh, but also in political and social practice, it, it is contested all the time on a daily basis, um, and uh, as a means of resistance and control, you know, not just as an academic concept. That may be the one constant thing that we can say about it, that it's changing, um, and that people can't agree about it, and that people fight over it. Um, some would say that there's nothing new to say about power and empowerment, so why bother taking time to write about it? Well, it's all there in the literature. This hasn't been our experience um, as editors and authors. We found ourselves part of a quite sort of vibrant and growing community of people, including many of the people in IDS and the people we work with around the world, who are deeply interested in power and how it works, um, how it can be uh, created uh, by people attempting to build power, how it can be resisted, um, what its implications are for, for policy, for strategy, for action. Um, and I think getting to grips with power and empowerment has, in our experience, become a really important part of the work of organizations and movements and activists who are trying to make the world a, a fairer and more equitable place and to figure out what to do. Um, and I think this is partly because we are living in very contentious, power-laden times, uh, where conventional methods of voice and advocacy uh, and lobbying, the kinds of things that you hear about how you make change happen in pluralist democratic politics, aren't really working anymore. I think we all know that from our experiences of uh, various kinds of social change work, activism, environmental work, and so on. So power is taking dramatic new uh, shapes and demanding new thinking. And we're witnessing huge shifts in things like ge global geopolitics, um, ideological narratives, uh, how truth is defined, um, things like how do we value human rights and dignity. You know, all of these things are sort of suddenly no longer agreed and being contested in ways that are quite worrying space for civic and political voice and activism is closing. Um, in the front lines of environmental protection and climate change work, we're also seeing new levels of uh, repression and police uh, brutality and so on. 
struggles for gender equality, uh, sexual freedoms, and so forth are also facing increasing backlash uh, in, the, in the wake of new fundamentalisms and ideologies and so on. And then there's the world of digital information control and uh, mass surveillance, just to add the icing to the cake. So the, the, the nature of power is dramatically shifting, although I think we can all find examples of all the things I've mentioned probably through history in one way or another. But with it are also changing what we think about as the forms of empowerment and social change. Um, and these, I think it's important to point out, are not necessarily positive or progressive. There's a lot of social change activism going on that is, that is regressive and not in favor of equity. So in this context, as editors and authors of this book, we found ourselves drawn into really interesting debates about power and about what can be done about it in a very practical sense. And we're finding that those who are on the front lines of seeking justice and equality are having to respond to these new configurations of power and to find ways of resisting and countering them and of building their own power. So that's the, that's the kind of why power and why now. Um, there are lots of things we could say about the uh, interface of this book with academic theory on power and social theory and so forth. I'm just going to mention a few. Um, <clears throat> and I think that the book really tries to address some dimensions of power that are perhaps a little bit more elusive and uh, not taken up as much in some of the more instrumental approaches to power analysis, such as political economy, um, which is widely used and tends to focus more on visible um, actors and formal political processes and, and um, guessing what people's um, interests and motives might be and then sort of a kind of game theory approach to power. That can be very useful in certain kinds of power analysis, but we found it limited. Um, and I think uh, one of the things we've found worth looking at, if you think about power as an iceberg, is that a lot of... Uh, Power analysis tends to focus on the, I think students will be familiar with this already, um, the actors and processes that are visible that are above the waterline. And I think what we've tried to do in the book is delve below the waterline and to look at the dimensions of power that take the form of dominant narratives, socialized norms, embodied behavior, um, norms of speech and behavior, the, all the things that kind of undermine, underpin uh, social structures and, and political power. Um, and then we need to look, well, what are the points of resistance and leverage and change at that level uh, that will not necessarily take the form of just formal making demands and, 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 um, and protest? What are the dimensions of popular education, of consciousness raising, of movement building, um, and creating new narratives, social uh, visions um, of what the world that we'd like to have? Another dimension, I think, is... Uh, that we find have found that the book uh, takes up quite a lot is to go further into this idea of hidden power, which is kind of classically defined in some of the literature as the second dimension of power. That's the power of agenda setting, mobilizing bias, gatekeeping, who's in the room, who's out, exclusion, inclusion, all of that, which happens in politics all the time. It's the daily business of politics. And what many of the authors, and particularly those from the organization Just Associates and those working on uh, also uh, environmental defenders, protection and rights, are looking at what we're calling shadow power, which is the form of, of hidden power that is more insidious, uh, corrupt, that involves collusion between organized criminal elements, uh, mafias, uh, corporations and extractive industries, uh, particularly in mining and forestry, um, water, and so on, who are often in, in collusion with paramilitary forces, security forces, and state actors. Um, and this isn't new, as we know from John Gaventa's work on coal mining in Appalachia uh, many years ago, which kind of gave rise to a lot of this thinking about power. This shadow power evades the usual channels of accountability and of political and legal redress because it's so hidden and obscured and because it's violent and frightening and people are, are sort of frightened into silence. And the third one I would mention is um, what is in the book called transformative power. And that's again borrowed from 
our colleagues, uh, Lisa Veneklassen, Alexa Bradley, and Valerie Miller, and others in the organization Just Associates. And these are the forms of positive power that often don't get picked up in power analysis. These are the forms of agency, of social and political agency, or power to, uh, the forms of uh, human dignity and self-belief and self-esteem that need to be built in any kind of successful movement, which is a, the power within, and the collective power of people acting around the same visions and, um, and values, which is the power with of, of collective action. And in the book, uh, some of the authors actually in, articulate a new dimension of this transformative power, which they're calling power for, which is the power uh, of creating a vision and articulating a narrative that is a positive alternative to the dominant narratives that we're asked to, to uh, accept as given. So th I think these are just a few to give you a flavor of some of the ways in which they're recognizable in existing power theory, but they're going beyond it. And I'd just like to turn over to Rosie now to um, make a couple of points from her perspective. Thank you. So my two favorite points about the book. Um, one of the big things that we've tried to do in the book is make not just the theoretical conceptual contributions that Jethro talked about, but also make really practical contributions. But the book is not a toolkit. We actually started off having discussions with our publishers about a handbook, and for the first long while that we were working on it, we were talking about the handbook, and even the handbook sounded too toolkitty, so we gradually slithered out of the handbook language and the handbook mode. Um, so it's not a toolkit, but of course tools are useful, they're important, we need them for analysing, we need them for planning, for strategizing. and in fact some of the chapters in the book and some of the things we're going to talk about today are to do with tools which can be used for analysing power. John is, has written a chapter about the power cube, which lots of you will be familiar with already, and we'll be talking about that, and that's a, a highly versatile, quite complex tool that can be used in very simple ways or quite complex ways to unpack the realities of power, particularly for analysing, diagnosing um, power situations, but also for strategising about power. So it's not to say in any sense that tools are no use, it's just that we think that there's always this reflex, knee-jerk kind of reaction to reach for the nearest tool and perhaps use it quite unreflectively and unreflexively without thinking about oneself, putting oneself into the picture, which we think is quite problematic when it comes to an issue like power. So a lot of the book's content actually demonstrates some of the problems associated with too much of a toolkit-centric approach. One of the problems, of course, is that attention can end up getting focused on the wrong thing. It can end up getting focused on using the tool right instead of whether the tool was the right thing to do in the first place or um, whether it's uh, being used in a way that's suitably contextualized. It can lead to diverting attention away from the people who are bringing in the tool. And this is something that the aid industry, the development aid industry, is famous for, bringing in tools and concepts and frameworks and planting them into a situation in a way which doesn't enable the bringer of the tool to be put in the picture and to be analyzed and looked at. And when we're talking about power in relation to development aid and social change processes, very often the actors who most need looking at, or who definitely need looking at, are the, the aid actors themselves, as some of the content in the book, particularly the, the chapter by Rosalind Aben, our ex-colleague colleague here, um, discusses at length. So I think we, we are trying very much to make a practical contribution, but not by providing new tools. In what ways are we trying to make this practical contribution? Well, there are a lot of chapters in the book which really demonstrate the importance of participatory and reflective approaches to working on power, whether it's to understand power in particular contexts or whether it's to um, formulate strategies for addressing power and trying to transform power. There's a, a chapter, for example, by Joe Rowlands, a colleague from Oxfam, who many of you know, a gender officer at Oxfam, um, who writes about Oxfam's experience over decades of trying to address power in its programs through the work of Oxfam staff and with Oxfam partners by using participatory reflective approaches. And she really scrapes beneath the surface and talks about the challenges of doing that from an organization of that kind and, and all that's implied. And it's very clear that tools in themselves aren't enough and a great deal more of skills building in terms of reflective analysis is necessary. There's a chapter as well by a colleague, Walter Flores, whom some of you know, who runs the Center for Equity and Health Systems Governance in Guatemala. And his work is exclusively with uh, remote, marginalized indigenous communities and trying to ensure their access to healthcare. So he has a, a chapter in here where he talks about having started to work on 
power with um, these communities and having started by using some of the tools which, which lots of us know and realizing after a time that they were talking past each other and that of all the people who needed to be given voice to speak about their experiences of powerlessness and marginalization, he had some of them in front of him and uh, they threw away the tools. They tore up the toolkits and started instead an approach that's much more like a Paolo Freirean popular education type approach of generative questions to lead people to reflect in a structured way around their own experience and found that that was a much more useful way of working on this in that context. Another practical contribution I think the book makes is um, starting from that recognition of, of the importance of reflective approaches, working upwards from people's own experience of the problem. So in the case of the chapter by Walter that I mentioned, he calls it micro-level analysis of power, starting from people's own experience. Some of the other chapters talk about various experiences of collective analysis, collective strategizing. Um, there's a, a chapter of ours in which Jethro and I and an ex-MAP student actually tell the story of the masters in power participation and social change here at IDS, which Jethro and I worked on for many years, and some of you in the room are on at the moment, and some of you have been on in the past, and lots of the other staff in the room have contributed to, where um, what we're really trying to do with that masters is take um, people who have got some experience of practice already and who want to become more self-critical, more reflective, more reflexive practitioners through a year-long process of experiential learning techniques and learning about how to do action research and uh, coming out at the other end really sometimes quite, quite different from how they came in, I think. It certainly changes us, the staff involved in it. Um, I think another uh, very important contribution made by some of the chapters is pointing to the centrality of the self in power analysis, either as part of the problem, as in the case of Rosalind Aben's chapter about how aid actors are very often part of the problem in development aid, or as part of the solution, to point to a chapter by Just Associates colleagues um, writing about using popular education, feminist popular education approaches with women in, in Mesoamerica. The women as part of the solution, women in very subordinate positions who are struggling against all manner of discriminations and marginalizations, and who are working with the Just Associate colleagues uh, through these processes to develop their own self-esteem, to develop consciousness, and to form uh, movements at the local level, um, which can really change their, their positioning in the power dynamics that they're part of. So that's, I think, one of the important contributions. Um, another key point about the book, which I'm particularly passionate about myself, is to do with the relationship between theory and practice. Um, between theoreticians and practitioners around this subject of power. Far too much of the debate on power in political science journals is really quite spectacularly disconnected from the realities of people who are on the hard end of power dynamics. Um, some of the debates even give the impression that debating about power is a mere kind of intellectual curiosity. It's, it's done for, for academic reasons rather than anything else. Not all of it, but some of it. So we really wanted the book to contribute to not just to bringing forth all of these practical experiences, but really trying to make theory more tractable and useful for people who need it for, for doing the, the power praxis, you might want to call it. Um, and so I, mean, I struggled a lot with this myself in writing the main chapter that I've contributed to the book, which is about rethinking accountability work from a power perspective. I went into real kind of agonies and sweated blood, sweat and tears over um, trying to unpack some of the complexities of power theory, which. I personally found very, very difficult to understand um, and try to pull out from them what is it about this that can be useful for people wanting to, um, people who are immersed in, in struggling with these issues in practice. So that kind of demystification process, which I hope will set out some insights that practitioners working on this can then um, see resonance with and use them better um, to illuminate their practice. But there's a different way around to this as well, which is as well as asking how theory can better inform practice, we've really asked ourselves, how can these practitioners' innovation and adaptation and reframings and contextualization that they do all the time intuitively and instinctively and constantly, how can they be used to enrich and to renovate power theory? And some of the chapters in there, I think, perhaps by the, the feminist colleagues and just associates are a particularly good example of this. They really do present a continuous reflection on practice. And there's some which take a 10-year horizon on, on what uh, Just Associates, how Just Associates has been working on these issues, which really shows how they're evolving theory from their own practice. And if these kinds of insights ever get noticed by power theorists, and we hope that perhaps by putting some of them in this book they will, um, they'll be very, very helpful in terms of refreshing and updating power theory for our times and for addressing uh, 
contemporary challenges. Power theory is far too important to leave to academic political scientists. And these debates are very much dominated by northern white academic, often male elites, very rarely grounded in any of the real experience of marginalization. So we think that there's this whole body of practical power theory that we're trying to bring forth in the book a bit and give a platform to these people who are making theory in their practice and feel that they can really contribute to processes of theory building about power and empowerment and social change. So to hand over to one such person, Fran, would you like to come and tell us about your work with... Hello, nice to see you all here. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I was very happy to be part of this process uh, of writing the book, getting to be one of the contributing authors, uh, because it, particularly because it gave me an opportunity to learn from other people working in this space and to have a chance to reflect on my experiences and and in a sense, to get another angle, to get another perspective or lens on those experiences to try to understand them um, better. So I wrote a chapter called Environmental Defenders, Courage, Territory, and Power, uh, which is drawing on uh, my work mainly in Cambodia um, over the last um, 10 or approximately 10 years. And as a re I was working first in Cambodia as a researcher, but got involved in a uh, community um, activist group protecting a forest called Cray Long in central Cambodia um, and started making a documentary film. And during that time, I got to know one of the leaders of this activist group who actually met on the day of a very large protest. And there was a moment in that protest uh, when, for me, the... Um, reality of, of me having power myself sort of crystallized, uh, which was, so we had been um, in this site where there was a conflict between the protesters uh, and the controllers of a rubber company. So um, there were company guards and the protesters had piled up very large logs of luxury timber and were burning them to destroy um, the profit making links. Um, and they had, um, the logs were burning down, and I was sat next to a man called Chibuti, who is one of the advisors of this group. And we saw soldiers approach us, and they came up behind Viti and I, uh, grabbed Viti around the neck, lifted him up and threw him to the ground. And I was um, holding out my camera and shaking, but and then uh, when I looked up and there were guns pointed at me, I sort of immediately just jumped out of the way. And at the same time, our community defenders who were, had been a bit behind us ran up and, and came up right beside us. And so for me, I became aware of my own instinctive reaction to this force, to this um, violence, um, you know, in immediately getting out of the way. But at the same time, witnessing the communities and indeed Viti as he chose, you know, to stay there and, you know, he didn't run away when we first saw the soldiers coming. And so they uh, demonstrated this choice um, not to have an immediate reflexive response, um, but to choose to dare. And so in the first part of the chapter, I was sort of reflecting on this experience um, and how in this moment I became aware that I too was not simply a documentary maker or not a researcher, but I was present, I was physically present. Um, there were guns pointed at me so I could, you know, accidentally be shot in this moment. And that was a very um, empowering experience in a strange way because um, I think to realize your own uh, your own power in the sense of that you could, you might react in one way, but you could have reacted another way. Other people are reacting another way. Um, that was in a way the, the beginning for me of this journey of trying to understand um, power and a self-reflective moment. Um, so at that moment also, when the community members rushed forward, they actually put themselves in front of the guns and, and surrounded Viti and pulled him out of the situation. And we all then um, went with him, like surrounded his car, 
And we walked out of the forest for about 20 kilometers into the night. And so he was saved in that moment by the collective action of the community around him. And one of the community protesters, as um, in this moment of conflict, shouted, you have guns and we don't. So who is powerful? And it was such a, a poignant uh, question um, and one that stuck with me and that, you know, is, is in the film that I made. Um, but in, it was such a clear articulation of the power of the community is their, their power with each other, sort of the transformative power that Jethro um, mentioned. And um, when I was researching for this chapter, I was reading um, Hannah Arendt, and she writes um, about power and violence in a book from the 1970s. She says, when we say of somebody that he is in power, we actually refer to his being empowered by a certain number of people to act in their name. Um, this is quite a narrow definition uh, and you know, one of the ways in which she sees power, but, but it, was, it struck me that Chutvati is one example, in a sense, of somebody who you know, his power in that moment was due to his position in that collective. Um, as, a, as a leader and advisor of the activist group, he was someone who people would act with, uh, people who would act to save, even at great risk. Um, and in 2016, another environmental defender called Berta Caceres, I'm sure many of you know about her, she was um, a indigenous leader from Honduras and a women's rights activist as well. Um, and she was murdered in her own home um, and assassinated in, a, I guess, an act which is the final ultimate exertion of the power to, to silence another actor. Um, and in the, the assassination produced a very widespread outcry. And um, part, of that, part of the response from the defenders and from her family, um, this is her daughter, Betita, in the photo who's speaking. Um, the, the great slogan was Berta vive, like Berta lives. And um, Berta no murió se multiplico, I think. I don't speak Spanish, but um, Berta did not die, she multiplied. And this was something also that I had witnessed in the aftermath of um, Chutvati's murder. So Chutvati, after the instance when I met him, was killed five months later. Uh, but this rallying cry and this attitude um, that the spirit lives on and that we as a collective, um, or that they as an individual, are greater um, than their atomic individual life, that they are part of this collective which lives on, which has multiplied. Um, is, uh, for me, a very powerful um, expression uh, of power with this collective, collective action, collective energy, and one which also, in its articulation, is a, is a way of um, overturning the narratives that seek to destroy the power of resistance movements. So this articulation of our power together, that she did not die, this absolute you know, contradiction of fact, is, in a way, in a very powerful expression um, of the greater power that she had. Um, the other point that I went on to examine and to reflect on in the chapter was about um, my work in, in Cambodia again uh, with another activist group, which was actually inspired by the story of Chutvati. And this activist group was um, a youth movement called Mother Nature Cambodia. And I was reflecting on the importance of space and territory in terms of power. So this is one part of the chapter. The struggle over land and the environment is inherently spatial. The ways in which power is manifest in this struggle are perhaps more obviously physical and geographic in this than in other struggles for social justice. Indigenous peoples, traditional communities, and all who live in and close to the forest have a knowledge of paths, waterways, the species that can be eaten, stems that hold water that you can drink, high grounds and hiding places that translates to power, mastery of the environment through intimacy with it. So in this part, I was reflecting on um, the ways in which the environment is also part of um, the power that people express and that sustains them in their struggle. Um, so that the land grabbing, the logging, is directly a physical attack on this greater power that people have as part of their environment. 
So I wanted to close with um, a one minute video from, so in my work with Not One More, we worked with Frontline Environmental Defenders. It's an organization mm -hmm. that I co-founded with some other colleagues and Jethro is one of the trustees actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I wanted to share this short video, which is, um, which was developed as a collective at the last conference that we held. Um, and I think it expresses some of the, the ways in which resistance movements are continuing to build their collective power. So. I hope this works. Muito de nós, defensores da floresta, da terra e das águas. Muito de nós, defensores da floresta, da terra e das águas, não pode mostrar os seus rostos. Porque foram assassinados, porque são criminalizados ou porque são invisibilizados. Nós precisamos olhar com mais carinho para o nosso povo. O mundo precisa saber que os defensores da floresta estão sendo assassinados, que os defensores dos campos e das águas estão perdendo suas vidas por defenderem o bem da humanidade. Por favor, respeite a nossa luta ou lute junto conosco. A nossa luta não tem fronteiras! Well, I think the last presentation shows in a way why, how important and timely this book is. So I want to, to pick up, first of all, by Jethro's first point, that the study of power and the analysis of power is absolutely critical for so many issues which we're fighting and dealing with in our time. It always has been, but in some, some sense the urgency is even greater now. And for me, I want to just before I move to my chapter, which was about the power cube, many of you in the room know about this story, um, I just want to begin by congratulating Rosie and Jethro. It's a fantastic contribution. I picked it up over the weekend and really had a hard time putting it down, even though I was familiar with the concepts. What they have done is given us a, a life to the concepts. It's, you know, I studied power as a PhD student 40 some odd years ago. And I've had a sense that, yes, it's been that old, that long. <laughs> I've had the sense that the power theory has been a bit stuck. What I studied from the theoretical point of view in the mid 70s, Luce, Foucault, Bordeaux, Dahl, are still the theorists that we assign to our students today. It's been stuck, and it's been stuck for some time. But what has happened in power analysis over the last 40 years has been a phenomenal adaptation and empirical application by activists of how to understand power. And as Rosie said so clearly, there's this, I love your word, fantastic or superb or some superlative disconnect between the theorists on power who still have to go to these conferences or still debating the same things we could talk about 40 years ago, and the rich movement of how to use power analysis to strengthen struggles for justice and rights around the world. And the book, the book does a brilliant job of, of not rejecting that theory, but enlivening it, of giving it a richness based on experience. And also, in order to do that, the huge amount of work that Rosie and Jeff wrote, put in, which many authors don't do, to help activists put down in writing their intuitive and tacit knowledge. And some of the authors here are people that I've known over the years, I've learned from greatly, but they've never put it down. And now we see the work of Joe Rowland and Just Associates and Fran and others and activists seeing on the written page that, that can enliven and strengthen others. So I just want to say, sort of violating my, my presentation, a big thanks to Jethro and Rosie. Now, I was invited to do a chapter about the power, the uptake of the power cube. Now, many of you at IDS know about this this framework, some of you 
Some of you uh, are new to IDS. Welcome to our friends from Lewis and, and, and others uh, who, who, who are here. So the Power Cube was a, a framework that was developed here at IDS. Um, first presented in a seminar in 2002 where I had the idea of bringing together different debates we were having to analyze power. Um, and then began to get picked up and used by many a number of people who in the book, and, and including Jeff Rowe and Rosie. And then in a workshop here in this room, we, a number of activists came together and said, well, this potentially is a really rich framework for understanding our experiences. And based on that, we launched 10 years ago the now relatively static site called PowerCube.net. So if you haven't looked at it, new students and community members, please take a look. And PowerCube.net has surpassed all of our expectations in terms of how the PowerCube has been picked up and used by others. Um, the site currently gets about 300,000 down, down visits a year for a static site 10 years later. Um, in preparation for this article, we had some help from research assistants, Pia, um, and we found over 500 examples uh, through Google of the application of the power cube, not, not citations, but a real application of it, covering a wide range of issues. So power cube analysis in depth, focusing on digital politics, on economic inequality, on the environment, on fair trade, health, housing, humanitarianism, human rights, hunger and nutrition, legal empowerment, mental health and psychiatry, participation in governance, peace building, policy processes, and water to name a few. So we're somewhat gratified to see that, that this, this framework, um, which really came out of collective work with people in this building and the Power and Popular Politics cluster, has spread so organically and rapidly around the world. I've been particularly gratified by two or three personal stories. A couple of years ago, I went to uh, see a young doctor in my local community clinic in Cassips across the, across the way here. And, when I finished seeing this young doctor, he said, Kaventa, did you have anything to do with the power cube? And I said, yes. <laughs> and they had just had the power, this young doctor strike, and they had used the power cube in his training. He said, I found it really useful. And last week, a teacher contacted IDS. Do you know anything about the power cube? And she's using it working with students uh, here in, in Sussex and teaching students how to analyze power at this time with student activism. And fortunately, the power cube, for those of you who don't know, is now has an animated cartoon that goes along with it. So it's a great teaching tool for for students, but for me the highlight I think was when it was spoofed two years ago in the IDS Panto. <laughs> uh, but what is the power cube? So we were humbled by seeing how this how this has spread. Um, this, as Rosie said, it's not a it can be used as a tick box, and that's the wrong way to use it. It isn't simply a matter of checking all the different boxes, the forms, faces, and levels of power. But it's 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 a framework for understanding power and the way it affects your life in, in real time in multiple ways. And I think people find it important in reviewing these articles of how they've used it. They found it important for two or three things that Jethro's already mentioned. One, it highlights invisible power. And for those of you out of IDS, that's our word for the, the issues of power that never get into the public domain. And we see that currently now. Lots of debates going on in the public, in the elections, but the real issues of oppression and marginality somehow are silent. Sometimes they're silenced by violence, as you talk about. Sometimes like two minutes, I just didn't start. Um, <laughs> it's also used to look across levels from local to national to global. It's also used to, to, to understand the risk of invited spaces of participation, where it looks like participation, but in fact we all know that people can be invited to a consultation and that space is as full of power as not being in that space at all. In the work in this article, we tried to say, how have activists used the power cube? So we moved away from the academic understandings of what it taught us. And take a look. We found at least six broad ways that activists have been using it. They're all very inspiring. They've been using it for education and awareness building, talking about a way to do the popular education to help people understand power. What are the spaces of power in your life? Where are the opportunities? Where are the risks? It's used for context analysis. These days we hear a lot about political economy analysis, but much of it is about more institutional forms of political economy and power. And it ignores those more hidden and invisible forms of, of power. And, and this is a way, Jeff Rose talked about it, about that to get at these more, the deeper forms of power that are going on. I, I recently was on a Skype call looking at political economy in Nigeria, from which a very handsomely paid consultant had been, was giving the report. And this report in Nigeria about the political economy 
in the post-election failed to mention oil companies and failed to mention gender in an election that had the less women political participation than many, many decades. And somehow the traditional institutional analysis of power leaves out those hidden and more informed sources of power. It's been used by NGOs and development NGOs and, and development agencies for program planning and organizational learning. People have, have, done, have done diagrams of power and then said this is a way we're going to develop programs to deal with it. It's been used to develop advocacy campaigns. It's been used for protection of human rights and analyzing which spaces open and which spaces close over time in order to figure out the next move. Um, and, and so it's gratifying to see the number of uses of this, this format, this, this framework. And in the article, which I don't have time to go into now, we outline though this risk of misuse. And we outline about eight principles of how we think these forms of analysis of power can be used to strengthen the struggles for fairness and equity and justice. So for me, one of the most important forms of usage, which I talk about, is how the power cube brings together these multiple forms of power, which Jethro mentioned at the beginning, which those of us who talk about power all the time talk about the relationships between power over, power within, power with, and power to. And the power cube, I think, tries to bring these together. And the way I try to talk about it is the power within recognizes one's own agency and capacity to overcome those invisible forms of power. It's highly linked to, which is invisible power. The power with has to, has to do with building the alliances necessary to work across all the spaces and levels. Both power within and power with are critical for achieving the power to act, um, power to act based on collective action. And power within, power with, and power to, taken together, are necessary to challenge that power over that the elites hold in our lives. But I think we recognize that, for me, the most important lesson from all of this and from the book is what Jethro mentioned that our friends just associates have now been pointing out, that in a way the power cube, just like power analysis, can be used for progressive purposes, but it also can be used for regressive purposes. Purposes. People have pointed out this is a very good way for understanding the rise of the right. And they can also use it as a way to figure out how they mobilize to build their power. And therefore, I think this notion of the power for, which we talk about the combined vision, values, and agenda of change that motivate and orient the work we do, is most important. How do we build a vision for power, for changing power, not simply a tool for analysis? So for me, ultimately, power analysis, and I think the book makes this point very strongly, isn't an end in itself. Tools can be used, as Rosie said, for many purposes, both progressive and regressive. The power cube and other tools can be starting points in which we ground our work for change. But equally important, we must complicate our analysis with this final question. What is the world that we wish to see? What is our vision of the norms, values, and institutions which we hope to achieve through challenging existing power relations. With this compass, we are more likely to be able to not only analyze power, but to use such analysis to contribute to a more just and sustainable world. And the chapters in Jethro and Rosie's book give us a number of clues for how to do so. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to change hats, I think, and, uh, okay. and, and um, manage questions and facilitate for Rosie and, and others. Now, we, some of you will have to leave before two, so let's take one quick round of questions, and some of you may need to leave, and then we'll keep going. So open up questions, comments, your own reflections on analysis of power to, to our panel here. Thank you. So I'm Jörg, um, uh, work on gender and, and uh, masculinities. Uh, just a very simple question. It would be really great to hear what the other chapters are in the book, if there's like a table of content with, or just reading out you know, who's writing what in the book other than, uh, other than you. We've heard a few referred to, but it, it'd be great to 
I have a good sense of that. Um, thanks, first of all. It was brilliant, really exciting. I look forward to reading the book. Um, and um, one, one comment or, or question. Um, I've written about this and discussed it with, with you, John, as well. Uh, I find the Power Cube really helpful and useful. Uh, there's one aspect of it, though, or it's not so much of the cube as what, what is not in the cube um, that I struggled with, or a way of... Um, so I proposed turning the cube around to, to have a more embodied and gendered uh, phases of analysis for power, uh, one being uh, Rowlands for types of power, power over width within and so on, uh, and at ecological levels uh, from individual to interpersonal, institutional, and ideological. Um, and there is always a risk of confusing those levels with the more geopolitical levels there. Um, and then finally, uh, the multiple dimension we so often talk about uh, in terms of power and oppression being material, being sociocultural, political, um, but also uh, historical and, and uh, about identity, which relates back to the issues around reflexivity, re reflective, um, you know, the mirror on the intervener and the analyst. Uh, so just uh, great tools and, and great, um, I look forward to reading it. Thanks. I'm going to close this because the book is much more than the power cube, so I don't want that to be, be there. Yeah. Um, Robert, then we'll come back then. Would you read out the chapter? Thank you, thank you, thank you very much indeed for this book, and I'm very much looking forward to <coughs> reading it. Um, I was at the beginning when you had you had the. Um, I'm glad you used Wordle. It's very useful. But two words which I didn't see, and actually three words that I I didn't pick up, were behaviour, attitudes, and mindsets. But <coughs> on the other hand, you have picked up on that a lot in what you've been presenting in terms of reflexivity and the importance of reflexivity. And this brings me to, to the, the power four, which I think is really, a, a, it's a powerful concept. The power four in relation to transformation. But what about, <coughs> that's, that's fine, and a great deal of this is all about movements and reinforcing movements and, and all the rest of it, which in a way is using power to empower but what about the negative side of this that we're living through at the moment of fake news, of, um, of Facebook filtering what mm -hmm. you receive from the way in which it's identified what sort of person you are and what you, and, and what you, uh, what you, what you prefer, what you want to hear? Because it seems to me that this is, in, in a way, it's, it's, it's very disempowering to be fed only the positive side that is known that you'll agree with. And I'm wondering whether there's a power to be reflexive and, and to counteract this negative power to filter information. Great. Well, let's just question here about the book, and then let's come back on those couple of really helpful comments. Do you want to take one about the chapters, Rosie? Sure. Yeah. So, um, Thank you, Jeff Yerka, for an me to talk more about the content of the book. Um, there are four main sections in the book. There's um, a first section, which is all about conception and theoretical groundings and debates. So a lot of that is kind of updated. So there's chapters there from uh, Lisa Bean Carson of Just Associates, who looks from the perspective of a, a feminist movement building uh, activist, looks over the past and says there's something different going on about this current moment. There's something disorienting, and we need to have a fresh look at lots of these concepts. There's a chapter by Pattern there about unruliness, which um, draws a lot of the thinking that's gone into teaching and working on unruly politics here at IDS, but, uh, but beyond, um, looking at the notion of the power of communitas and, and a kind of power with. Um, a chapter by me about accountability. A chapter by Jethro, which is all about embodied practice as one of the approaches to transforming power. And then a chapter by two colleagues from IT for Change in Bangalore, which is about a political practice of empowerment in digital times. Some very feminist uh, commentary from them on the digitization of, of governance relations and social relations and what that means from a power perspective. Then there's a section all about uh, frameworks and approaches where we're setting out some of them. This is where the chapter about John's chapter about the power cube goes. Another chapter from Alexa Bradley and Just Associates about uh, frameworks that they've used. The chapter by Joe Rowlands about the frameworks and tools that Oxfam has used. 
and the colleagues from Gender at Work, Aruna Rao and Joanne Sandler write about their um, Gender at Work framework, where people are uh, re critically appraising, I would say, those frameworks themselves and the uses to which they've been put, and in some cases updating and tweaking and adjusting um, frameworks to, to fit better with contemporary challenges. Then there's a section called uh, Understanding Agency, Social Action for Shifting Power, which is written um, from partly activist perspectives, and, and then Mario Costa, my colleague here, has contributed there as well, um, which is talking about examples of collective agency for really trying to shift power in specific contexts and situations. Um, and then the final uh, section is about unlearning and learning power for reflective social change. So there we talk about various ways of trying to train on power analysis or build consciousness or um, work with aid practitioners to help them to become more reflexive. So those are the, 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 those are the main sections. Um, I want to just reflect on one thing that Robert said at the end there as well, which was on invisible power. I think, I, I so agree that I think one of the things we need to take account of now is how deeply and how um, extensively we're all prey to invisible power the whole time and are only beginning to wake up to it. And it's become so incredibly embedded and it's at us from so many different sides and in so many different ways. It's very hard to see. It's part of the wallpaper. But I think for me, one of the heartening things about working with these people who've contributed to the book has been seeing activists who are, uh, through, through um, helping people to understand what invisible power is and what it's about, helping them to flip it and use it themselves. So not just resist it, not just notice when they're prey to invisible power in all kinds of ways, but to actually construct power through the same devices and be able to use that as a strategy. And it's not just invisible power that applies to, obviously, but I think for me that has been one of the kind of wakers that you know, just in terms of things like choosing what vocabulary you use and don't use and what messaging you're trying to uh, propagate yourself in your, I think is one of the, for me, one of the kind of eye-openers about getting to a deeper understanding of what's going on in terms of power today and using it for, for the good. Um, do you want to... Jethro, do you want well, to yeah, just briefly to respond to Jürger's comment about sort of uh, other dimensions of power that might not be picked up. And I think in, in some of the frameworks that we've shared today, like the Power Cube, and I think that's a, um, a fair comment. Actually, if you look across the chapters, there are others that um, address some of the other dimensions that you mentioned. I mean, I think Fran's chapter looking at spatial uh, and indigenous identities and how they're connected with the environment and how it's very different sense of kind of uh, identity and power than we might have in a more urban westernized uh, culture. Um, another chapter that I think has an interesting framework is the one by Aruna Rao and Joanne Sandler from, just, from, from uh, Gender at Work, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And their framework, I think, takes a, has a slightly different take on looking at that spectrum from the individual to the collective and from the sort of formal to the informal. And of course, they focus their attention on the collective informal, which would be the norms, the sort of what they call them deep structures, which I think is, a, you know, addresses some of the things you were getting at. But I think actually your comment is, you know, also a reminder to us that, um, that these frameworks are fluid and expanding and changing and they're not comprehensive. And I think as John said, you know, we can't just get stuck in one way of describing power, we need to be continually questioning and searching and, and inventing theory. And I often used to love to say to students, you know, don't think of theory as something you find on a shelf in the library. It's actually how you think about your experience and make sense of it and generalize it. And, you know, that's theory. You're making theory all the time. And I think we just, that this is an invitation to keep on inventing it. Um, maybe just one final comment in response to Roberts. I, I really appreciate your comment about attitudes, behavior, um, beliefs. And um, this is a chance for me to plug something that I say in my chapter, which is really that I think um, a lot of the approaches to kind of critical consciousness raising, popular education, and so on, fall a little bit short of getting to the real essence of behavior, beliefs, and attitudes in that I think we have a tendency to subscribe to a rather kind of logical, analytical, Cartesian view of uh, how beliefs relate to behavior. And somehow this idea that if we shift our lenses or our beliefs that we're going to behave differently because of some new framework that we've put in front of ourselves. And I think, you know, most of our experience in looking at this, you know, in depth is that 
behavior and belief is actually very deeply embodied psychological, uh, and you know that. You're married to a psychologist, don't you? <laughs> so, you know, uh, that, you know these, are, these are very deeply um, socialized, habituated ways of being that don't easily give way to some new concept. And that, therefore, the implication is, if we want to change, uh, that the change process itself needs to be creative, embodied, um, enacted, um, in, and through a whole process of kind of unlearning and relearning through, through our bodies and through our creativity and our imagination. And I think that's a really good reminder in a kind of social science research institute where we tend to gravitate to the, to the analytical and conceptual as the kind of savior, um, that, that somehow these two have to be nested together. Uh, not that one is better than the other because they're both important, but we need to find ways to integrate them in the way we do pedagogy and learning and analysis. And I've learned everything I just said from you, so there you go. <laughs> other comments, questions, reflections? Oh. I do want to add something, actually. Um, so, <laughs> I, I really liked your comment about attitudes and beliefs and um, reflecting on Facebook and how I think all of us are increasingly aware of algorithms and this sort of these invisible forces and, and the way in which also data, you know, is being, is being used and then very actively sort of collected from all of us and our sort of collective power then being transformed into something which is then fed back to us. Um, but particularly, I was thinking also about how, in some ways, I think power, like the, the invisible power um, of a belief or an attitude is often more powerful the more invisible it is, in a way. So like the unspoken norms are often the ones that we kind of stick to the most closely, and it, um, it's actually, I'm um, vaguely remembering something I was reading in undergrad from, you know, Martin Heidegger's work about um, technology and that how, um, how the setup or, uh, you know, as you were saying about participation, who isn't there, you know, the, the thing that's really hard to notice is sometimes the most powerful. And also, uh, you know, as an activist or from an activist standpoint, sometimes when we're, um, when the, we use voice and it's very clear where that attitude is coming from, it's sometimes not as powerful or as effective it, as if you can sort of express something more invisibly or more subtly. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but I'm thinking about how sometimes like if it's too easy to label you as a greenie or as a you know like exarb and crusties or whatever, it's a very easy way to dismiss um, an attitude or an or a belief that you're trying to communicate. And I was just reflecting on how yeah, perhaps you know when we use narrative, you know there's also ways maybe that we can do it more subtly in a in um. And perhaps more, um, yeah, that's a very, very half form thought, but it, that was what was inspired by your question. So. Well, hi. Um, I'm not an academic, so I'm just talking from experience, but I was with a group of people who were arrested recently, and they were talking about how they felt like very small children when they were in a police station and they couldn't go to the loo, they couldn't drink, they couldn't eat when they wanted to, and how that flipped for, the, for them from a very powerful stance when they're out in the streets to suddenly embodying, if you like, that experience of being a toddler, really. And I just thought that related a bit to what we were just talking about. Thank you very much, sir. Could I respond to that very briefly? I just wanted to tell a very quick story because uh, there's a wonderful photograph uh, taken in Robben Island of Nelson Mandela and Tabu and Becky in jackets. It's from the waist up and they're in conversation with each other. It's a black and white photograph and it symbolizes enormous dignity, self-worth, you know, the way they're dressed and everything. What you don't see that the photographer told the story later is that they're wearing shorts and they have bare feet because they were, they were infantilized by the prison system. 
by being made to wear shorts and not being aware, allowed to wear shoes. And in the background, you can see people 10 meters apart all breaking up stones with their hands, with hammers, which is what they were doing the moment before the photograph was taken. And in that moment, they chose to present themselves in that way, and they instructed the photographer to take them from the waist up and to take them in engaged in conversation. And that photograph gave enormous hope to the anti-apartheid movement, because you know our leaders are alive and well, and they're in jail, and they're talking to each other, and they're planning our future. So I just thought it was just a reflection from what you said, <laughs> how to turn that moment around, if you can. We have another author in the room, uh, Pata. And Pat, I wonder if you want to share just any, any feelings about reflections on, on your chapter, which again, I've known Pat for many years, but I had a chance to look at her chapter over the weekend, and I thought, wow, this is a really important set of new insights from Pat. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. Um, I, in a way, I was being, well, I was trying to be unruly, because I, I like unruliness. I feel that unruliness is in, somehow important. Um, this point about algorithms, actually, is, is one of the things I'm, I'm kind of aware of, is that algorithms are, are making use of our individuality, our, every single contribution any of us makes, at least digitally, is, is, is organized and, and, and used in some ways to reorganize our world. Um, and so I was thinking that there's an aspect of power that even, dare I say it, the power cube, um, the, the power cube builds, I think, on a sense of individuality, of lots of individual atoms all coming together, power with, we have power within. And we know that individuality is there, it's real. Uh, but at the same time, if we forget that there's another completely permanent existence where we are all together, we are all together, not only as, as human beings, but also as, as nature. And that includes all the way down, like the Native Americans would say, to the rocks, that we are all together with those. And that is an existent form of power. And if you forget that, you end up accepting that the only way to transform power is, as it were, through being a bunch of individuals who come together or to work against uh, an algorithm in an algorithmic sort of way, which of course you have to do because that is what most of us are, you know, that's our existence. But there is also this other thing that I was, I was, I have discovered through uh, uh, investigating unruly politics, which is why is it that people, what do they feel when they are together? What do they feel when they're trying to say, this is what justice looks like for us? What they feel is this, this idea which, I've culled from other places called communitas, which is of being together with all other things in the world and, and acting as if that were the power, that was the reality that we care about and that we are therefore acting to, to actually bring back together. And this is why what Fran is saying is so interesting. Because indigenous people, of course, never lost that understanding. And that's why they hold, actually, some of the, the wisdom and knowledge that we need, even though it's not very modern and not very understanding of algorithms, it is actually some of the knowledge that we need to, to create this transformation we're looking for. John. I'm wondering if you can help disabuse me of a belief. My belief is based on, I'm haunted by a number of graphs. One of them is the graph of inequality both in our own country and globally. Another is the mass of graphs evidencing the progressive failure of all the environmental movements to turn back the tide of things like global climate change or um, exploitation of fossil fuels, etc. Is there any evidence in all your work that you've done that actually those graphs are telling us a lie in terms of the build-up and inequality of power in the modern world? <laughs> Sorry. <is it? laughs> Can I say a word on that? John, tell him yes, John, tell him yes. Go yes. <laughs> Come to my next lecture with the students on inequality next week. Mm. Um,
Because yes, while the data continues to show the growth of inequality, and yes, that continues to rise, the argument in power terms has always been that those at the bottom end of inequality, by definition, their voices will not be heard because you have to have a certain amount of socioeconomic status in order to organize to make your voice heard. So therefore, the rich get ri richer and consensus to that world builds along with it. But a number of people have suggested that inequality like climate change can reach a tipping point where it's causing so many inequities in everyday life that people start raising fundamental questions in ways they wouldn't before. And I think we can begin to see that tipping point. So graphs of protest in the last decade show that protest and unruliness are going up more rapidly than they have been previously, and they're more about inequality than they have been previously. And the examples of the last month that we have seen, uh, Chile, uh, massive protest. Chile is the most unequal country now in Latin America and perhaps the world. It's certainly right up there the, close to the U.S. and others. In Chile, interestingly, poverty rates were going down, middle class was growing, so the, the criteria of poverty alleviation wasn't what people were protesting about. It was a criteria of unfairness that austerity is inevitably unfair because it is one of, this is one of the most unequal places of the world. And similarly interesting in Hong Kong, that also is one of the top ranking countries in the world in terms of inequality. And the protests there are billed in our Western media as protests against uh, freedom to, for dissent in China, et cetera, but they're also very much about control of the elite and inequality. Both Chile and Hong Kong, interestingly, in the U.S. indices of economic freedom, rank number one, or one and two. And they, as a result of economic freedom, they have become the most unequal places in the world. And I think the rise of popular protest that we're seeing in such situation perhaps represents a tipping point against the, the consensus that, that the past power the inequality has had to build its own consensus. More next week. <laughs> <laughs> Any other awesome questions, please? Yeah, on that note, um, I would like, uh, probably Rosie, um, in the bit where you were talking about the interface between the theory and the practice, to ask what would you therefore say to an international donor that says they want to work with those who are furthest behind? but also say equally often that they're not an NGO and you can see numerous levels of intermediaries getting in the way of any understanding even of the furthest behind and they're never in the same space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rosie, you want to reflect on that? know which development agency you're talking about and I'm glad I'm not in your shoes. <laughs> um, I, I think here, one of, and sorry to strike a more negative note after that and positive one, but I feel as if one of the big areas of ground that's been lost actually is work that's been done by colleagues here and elsewhere about working with aid actors to become more self-critical and reflective. Um, there was a, a time when have sensible conversations here with people who are leading bilateral and multilateral aid agencies about some of these issues. And I'm afraid those times are long gone, partly to do with how aid itself has changed and the, sh the, place, it, the place it occupies in life has changed and visions of it in sort of the sociology of the UK public or other European publics and northern publics has changed. Um, but I think what hasn't changed is some of the post-colonial legacies of blindness to power relations um, and to, yeah, I mean, the, the, now most of those agencies are staffed by people who are far too young to be carrying that legacy in themselves, but it shows the power structure, no? It's um, and a, a very, very unreflective attitude to their own agency within the context of those structures. Um, I 
I think you know, one way of, of addressing the leave no one behind agenda is the very welfare is its approach to doing it, which I think we've proven time and again in development is um, not transformative and not sustainable in the sense that it will ever become self-sustaining. And we're seeing it on the front of, of gender work by development agencies now, going back to the women and girls approach as the, as the right way and away from a, rights, a, a women's rights um, and a gender justice approach. So, um, as I said, I wouldn't like to be in your position, but I, I think that one of, the, um, one of the, the things that IDS has been strong on over the years has been um, trying to apply reflective learning with members of some of these aid agencies. And, and some of us keep on trying, and some of us in the room are involved in working with the FID on, in the Knowledge and Development Programme where there are learning journeys going on. But I think you, and you know, Juliet or others, Duncan, who's in the room who's been working on one, um, can, can speak better to this. But I think you know, some efforts at some level to try to build a degree of uh, self-critique and reflection in institutions which are not, um, where it doesn't sit comfortably with the institutional norms and with the incentives that those people are working under, um, but one can only hope are a way of chipping away at some of that, and I think we might have to kind of wait for quite a long time before some other cycles go round as another generations come up before we see big um, effects from that. But I don't know, Juliet, would you like to talk to that one at all as you're so closely working with DFID at the moment on learning? Yeah. learning journeys that do take place so it's not that people are not aware of them I would say it's the assumptions the cultural assumptions that govern the action uh, that is the problem and bringing that awareness together with the action I'm, I get in my conversations I feel both encouraged and then dismayed when people talk with quite uh, strong equality driven views and then say ah oh, but this is what we're going to do because this is how DFID works and this is how UK aid works so yes the struggle is to bring those two together um, I was actually going to say something on the earlier comment really in response to what John said which is it does all make sense to me because going back to the, uh, your comment makes a lot of sense to go, going back to the uh, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Atkinson book Spirit Level which is quite old now uh, he does talk about inequality as being the thing that matters most to people and that cites the most anger but that when people are in absolute poverty they don't have the ability the space the agency to do anything about it and maybe as those inequalities rise and those levels of ac absolute policy, uh, poverty get less people are in a better position to begin to act against it and do something about it. But certainly, it feels to me, the zeitgeist feels like that's what's beginning to happen now. Um, because the whole world is on the streets. Everywhere people are on the streets. So things, things are changing. But I can't talk to you about the, the, the charts and, and the, the proof behind that. I don't really have a question, but uh, oh, I have a lot of questions, but I don't think I can um, ask any of them before actually reading the book. I just want to, again, say thank you so much because I, I feel like I, I did development studies here last year and a bit of math, and I feel there exactly that gap between theory and practice and how practice informs theory and exactly that reflective learning in aid, in development, in power, is exactly what is needed, as you also say, and just thank you. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Fran, I just wonder, you mentioned that you had just come back from, over less that you just come back from Brazil with climate defenders. Mm. And, and I wonder if you might say something more about what you're seeing in terms of the hard edge of power. You know, a lot of our theorizing over the last 20 years, Jethro and Rosie, has been about ways in which apparent inequities or injustices are kept hidden. And a lot of those are the softer tools of power. It's about knowledge and discourse and algorithms, etc. But as people realize the inequities become so stark and people's voices begin to protest and merge, we're actually seeing that behind those softer edges of power are the hard power of violence. And I'm not sure it's invisible anymore. I think it's quite blatant what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And and that therefore we're in a new a lot of us at IDF to talk, we're in a new time. We so much of our work is based on the assumption that if we worked hard enough, we would open more democratic space. But now 
for the first time in 30 years, we're seeing around the world the rapid closure of that. I wonder if you could say more about how you see that affecting frontline workers that you're working with, such as in Brazil, where a society mm -hmm. that three or four years ago we were talking about was so open and democratic and progressive, and now we're mm -hmm. seeing massive violence against environmental defenders. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yes, yeah, so I was in Brazil for a month in October, and the video was from this conference. And um, it's a very painful moment, I think, for a lot of um, land and forest and water defenders in, in Brazil. They, I mean, these struggles have a very long history. That's the other thing, I think. Um, that I'm sort of slowly learning, like my background was always working in Cambodia, I know relatively little about Brazil. Um, and, but it was an incredible meeting in that we were coming together in the Amazon, in the south of the Amazon. You know, we saw some of the fires, you know, as we were moving around doing, we had a day at an indigenous village of the Gavaois. And um, I think what was, I mean, it was, it was a very intense experience, so, but um, basically I think one of the things that was so amazing about it then was that people were at very high risk. There were about 20 people there who were, um, had life-threatening cases, um, life, had been threatened with death or had, been, had violent evictions or people who were, who were physically attacking them. And um, there was finally sort of... Um, on the third day, there was a closed meeting, and I think it could only happen on the third day because we had been there enough, and there was enough sort of safety and sense of togetherness and enough trust among everyone. And I think um, it's actually interesting having this chance right now to reflect on it because actually I'm just thinking part of you know collective action and and that power with others is is really deeply about trust. Um, but also one of the ways in which it's so hard and so painful when you're getting those kind of threats and attacks is that you, it becomes very hard to speak about um, because people don't have the capacity or the space to hear those kinds of stories. You know, it's, it's hard. And of course, anyone who's been through a very intense personal trauma also you know, knows this and has experienced it. I think we all experience it in in lots of ways in our lives, like the most, the most painful and the most threatening things are the most um, hard to speak about because you can, you know, if it's not held carefully, it becomes undignifying. It's sort of the opposite of, of that story. That you, and, um, and the sort of the coming together and the opening up of your, your vulnerability and sharing your vulnerability um, is hugely empowering and sort of cathartic. And so... At the closed meeting, there were you know many people who were crying during what they were saying. Um, I'm getting emotional speaking about it. Um, we all sort of ended, but with our arms around each other, and um, and sort of Claude Lise, my colleague who really led the organisation of the conference, who's at great risk herself, um, sort of led us all in doing a sort of massage round at the end, where we all sort of turned to massage each other, then turned the other way. Um, spoke words of sort of our impressions or our feelings from, from the conference and it was um, but this also kind of came out of the overall experience you know there was a lot of music, there was a lot of dance there were the Kayapo and indigenous people were sort of doing the traditional tattoos like painting people um, and, and this sense of like energy and um, joy and celebration was also part, I think, of what made it possible to have that kind of coming together and, and the building of that trust. is like, it's almost like if you can see someone else's power and their, and their energy and their, you know, success, it also gives them space to show, you know, their vulnerability and the weaknesses um, that have been imposed on them. Let's wrap up. Had a final comment, and then I'll come to Rosie and Jethro to say anything about what next. Our final comments. That's very powerful what you've been speaking about. I just wanted to add on. I would say that violence. I, I said Mara Pantazido. Uh, she put a, a little clip from Chile on on her Facebook uh, feed. Just I don't know yesterday, where you've got a, a, a an incredibly armoured. Um, policeman or whatever he is, 
just walking towards a protester and beating this protester into right in front of the camera. And the violence is terrifying, the same as what you're talking about. And what I would suggest is that violence, it's, a, it's supposedly um, sort of a, a, an alternative, or the, the, but actually violence is the ultimate form of ruliness. It is rule. And as such, the things that all of these people do when they are building trust and when they are um, singing and all of those things are absolutely vital to understand that violence isn't an exception. Violence is what is. It is the revelation of the hidden power, the invisible power, as well as the visible. And always was. And it is the ultimate thing to resist, as well as inequity. But violence is the ultimate form of inequity. Oh, sorry. Which is why nonviolence may be an ultimate form of power. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Rosie, Jethro, any final words? It's kind of impossible to wrap up. I think the thing I would really like to say is how uh, all that I know on this, as, as you said to Robert, Jethro, all I know on this and all I think about, I've, I've gained so much of it from colleagues like you and others in the room here at IBS. And I, I think lots of us who work here sometimes feel that we are part of the problem. We're in terms of our identity as a white northern elitist academic establishment. But um, we must congratulate ourselves, all of us, and remember sometimes about good things that come out of here and about how if they're taken up and used in the right way and put into the hands of the right people, and if we do take the trouble to unpack them and to make them accessible and usable, then they too can contribute to some of those struggles out there that we're not directly part of, but that we very much like to think we contribute to sometimes. Ditto that, and maybe just to offer a few reflections on what Fran and Pata were sharing. I, I, I think um, we found in, in our partnership with Just Associates, which is a feminist movement building uh, collective uh, that's worldwide, that in the last sort of five years, ten years, they've had to completely shift their um, strategic orientation to the work that they do toward uh, protection. And uh, that wasn't always the case. Yes, their activists were were threatened and experienced threats and violence and so on. But now that is the focus, is uh, protection. And one of the things they've learned in working with human rights organizations, particularly the Fund for Global Human Rights, and uh, with some of the initiatives they've taken to really explore protection, and these are often uh, feminist activists, uh, LGBTQ activists, uh, people who are doing movement building, men and women in different parts of the world, um, is that they're questioning the uh, conventional human rights model that you would find with, say, classical amnesty-style advocacy, which is to highlight individuals like Berta Cassidas, who actually won the Goldman Award, you know, shortly before she was murdered. What people are finding is that the more you call attention to individuals and single them out as a way of protecting them, the more they simply get targeted that this is the, the shift that we're seeing, that those strategies maybe uh, need to be revisited and rethought. So what they've done is they've turned their attention toward the kind of thing that um, both Pat and Fran were talking about, which is forms of collective leadership, collective protection, solidarity, um, kind of building movements that don't have visible leaders uh, and where no individual is indispensable, where anybody could step up and step in and where you can't tell who's leading and who's following and I think that's that's a sort of a shift that we've seen in the last few years in the way people doing movement building are working um, so just wanted to add that um, it's been you know I feel like I'm continually learning and um, this has been a great seminar and I've really learned a lot from the comments and questions that have been asked as well as from my fellow panelists so I, I think this is, you know, all, it, although it's in ink and the ink is now dry, um, we'll probably, you know, it's not over and we're going to be able to keep having these conversations and evolving and uh, rethinking um, the lessons learned and the concepts as we go forward and, and hopefully they'll make positive contributions. Great. Cool. And on that.